what they are trying to create, we mentioned earlier, was this marketable title. Now, this marketable title has several things in it. It proves that there's no defects in the property, does not de depend on doubtful question of law or fact to prove its validity, it does not expose the purchaser to the hazards of litigation. Uh, it provides a reasonably well-informed and prudent person that they could sell it or mortgage the property. And remember, an unmarketable title still can be transferred. I could still sell it as a special warranty deed. It just does not protect the buyer to its fullest extent. Typically, what would happen is I would not get full value for that. All right. So there are things that prove ownership. The deed is not one of the things that proves ownership. What'd you say? Let me say it again. Deed, the actual deed is the worst proof of ownership of property. What the deed actually does is prove that there was a conveyance of ownership on whatever date that property held, all right? So the fact that I have a deed in my hand does not prove I own the property. So the buyer says, do you own the property? I go like, yeah, well, here's the deed. It's dated 1999 when I bought the property. The buyer's going to go, so you may have sold it since then. The deed is the worst effect. Now, many of you know, some of you don't, I'm a big cigar fan. I love cigars. So think of a match. When you strike a match, there is a fire on the end of that match. When you light the cigar, you transfer that heat from the match to the cigar. That, in essence, is the analogy. When the seller transfers it to the buyer, what do you do with that match when you're done using it? Exactly. You throw it away because there is no use for it. Now, the fact my cigar is lit only goes to show that at some point, the fire was somewhere else. A deed, once it serves its purpose, actually, theoretically, could be thrown away because it does not prove that you own the property now. It only proves that there was a transfer on whatever date that deed had on it. Matter of fact, when you go to sell your house now, they'll just make a new deed they're not going to use the one you got. They're going to make a new one because all it does is it serves that transaction boop, to show that symbolic transfer. And once that transfer happens, it's worthless. There are some other ways to show ownership. There's a thing called a certificate of title. Now, a certificate of title, much like a deed, is a dated document that can be created by the title company or an attorney or somebody like that that shows today's date that you are the owner of record. What it doesn't show is all the imperfections that may be there. So it doesn't show the liens and all that. And once again, the problem with a certificate of title is it does have a shelf life. What I mean by that is just like the deed. I show you the deed to the property I bought 20 years ago. Doesn't mean it's good today. So I go out and I get a certificate of title. That might be good for today. But what about 20 years from now? That certificate of title is not good again because it has a shelf life. So it still has the same problem as the deed, meaning time will make it ineffective. This here is uh, the attorney's opinion. Now, when the attorney did that suit to quiet title, he will write a letter to the title company saying that in his legal opinion, that this property is free from litigation. That would be his public search. 
and they would combine that with their private search to allow you to do that upgrade from the special warranty deed to the general warranty deed. That is called the attorney's opinion of title. That's what he would write to the title company. The best proof that you could have would be the title insurance policy itself. All right. The title insurance policy. If someone is willing to insure you, you could bet that you own it. All right. So the title insurance policy is uh, insures against the loss of the defects due to the title transition. And it's based on that title search that we talked about for the root or 40 years back. The title insurance, and let's go over here. I want to switch pages because I want to compare the title insurance to something else. So what I'm going to write is I'm going to write title insurance here. Now, over here, I'm going to write regular insurance. And what I mean by that would be health insurance, life insurance, renter's insurance, car insurance, all of those other things. All regular insurance actually works for futuristic stuff meaning I paid my car insurance this month. That is in case I have a wreck in the future. Well, next month I didn't use it, but I got to pay again for that month. So I keep paying forward for something that might happen. Health insurance, I pay it in case something might happen. Title insurance, however, only covers things that have already happened, like the Sears roof was put on three years ago, like the lien that got placed on it 22 years ago. So title insurance only covers things that have already happened. All right. Regular insurance, because it's covering things that are going to continue to happen, you might pay it on a ongoing basis monthly or annually title insurance because it is co covering things that have already happened that cannot change all right little soapbox here you can't change history all right no matter what people say so we already know it's happened therefore it can be found therefore we only need to pay it one time it is paid at closing for both parties. Regular insurance, in theory, could pay out an infinite amount of money. You get sick and you pay your insurance and you break your leg. They could pay for all of that stuff. It could have an infinite insurance payout. Title insurance can only pay up to the maximum value of the house. You buy a $250,000 house, you would get a $250,000 policy. The most they could pay would be $250,000 to pay the lender off and everybody starts again. You cannot profit from title insurance. You can't buy a $500,000 title insurance policy on a house you pay two hundred dollars for. You only pay the face value, and that would be the maximum loss that could ever happen on that title insurance. You do pay premiums, and you do pay premiums here, that one-time and that premium, once again, is based on the face value. So a $100,000 policy costs less than a $200,000 policy. That is the difference between title insurance and regular insurance, okay? <clears throat> the premium is paid one time at closing. There are different types of policies that can be out there. Those policies are written under uh, 
those title policies are, are written under ALTA, uh, the Land Title uh, Association. And there is a standard policy that covers certain things, right? Defects, forged documents, incompetent uh, sellers, meaning legally incompetent. And there is an extended policy. The extended policy obviously covers a little bit more stuff than uh, the standard policy. There are exclusions that are put on both policies. And these are obviously things that you wouldn't know about, like defects no, not known to the buyer, changes because of zoning. There's all kinds of that. There are also, whether it's a standard or an extended, there are two halves to the policy. There's the owner's policy and the lender's policy. All right. The owner's policy actually is issued to benefit the, the owner of the property so that he says, yes, I own it. Yes, I'll remove all the liens. And then the lender's policy is for the benefit of the mortgage E. Now, we've not talked about this yet because people think this is backwards. The mortgagee is the bank, all right? They are the ones issuing the money. You are the one making the mortgage. The bank is accepting it. We'll get to that, but a lot of people get these backwards and confused. Understand that the mortgagee is the bank. If there is no lender, like a cash policy, I have seen situations where there is no lender's policy at all, all right? Now, if you're lending cash or buying a cash, you may still want to get a lender's policy because you are, in essence, the lender. But I have seen deals in cash not have a lender's policy. Typically, these are split on the purchase agreement where the seller pays the owner's policy and the buyer pays the lender's policy. That is common tradition. Now, it may be different where you're living or what state you're in, but basically the seller pays the owner's policy while the buyer pays the lender's policy. Okay, that's typically how it works. Now, the last part here. <clears throat> I always ask this question because it's, sometimes it's easy to get the analogy. If you've ever gone into, let's say, a bar, and the bar cards you, and you show your passport, say, here's my passport. That passport has been issued by the government, and it is valid to use. Well, why is it valid? Because to get that passport, you actually had to show driver's license, birth certificate, social security card, whatever it was to get the driver's license. All right. You get what I'm saying here. It will fulfill all of these requirements because you needed these to get this. There is a system out there called the Torrens system. Indiana does not use it. Illinois uses it. It is nothing more than a database of ownership or a database of the registrar for the certificate of title so that you can actually show your Torrens card in place of your title insurance. Much like the passport, to get the Torrens card, you had to show all of this other documents to get this card, this card now becomes a replacement for this, much like the analogy that I just gave you of the passport replaces a, a driver's license or a valid ID, all right? That is called the Torrens system. All right, I wanna thank you for this chapter. Once again, if you have questions, feel free to email me. I'm at Raymond at realuniversity.com. Uh, once again, there are uh, questions in the back of the book. There are questions online. You should be practicing these. And I thank you for stopping by and invite you back to the next chapter.